Okay, it's 12.01. Welcome, everyone. This is uh, session three of the UCCS uh, Undergraduate Policy Research Showca Showcase. Um, we're really excited to be here. We've had two great sessions earlier in the morning, and we're so much looking forward to yours. Um, this event is a time to celebrate all the work that you students have put in over the quarter, um, the accomplishments that you've that you've made and and really especially in these ongoing times of uncertainty the tenacity that you've exhibited and in, in dealing with the you know the expected ups and downs of uh, of academic life which in some ways is like real life but not exactly um we also want to express our appreciation to the internship hosts who uh, who really make our program possible and who provide opportunities for experiential learning for all of you as you participate in the uccs program so thank you so much to the internship hosts who are able to be with us today and for everything that you do for our program and, and for our university of california students so um with that i'm looking forward to the presentation today and let's get going cindy fantastic thank you so much dr kravitz and so um the format today will be that each student will present after the student presents, we will take one question from their internship host site. If there isn't a question from the internship host site, then we will turn the question over to our academic team. We will have an open Q&A at the end of the session as time permits. And to start us off, our first student today is going to be Carlos Fernandez, who interned this term with the Office of California State Governor, Gavin Newsom. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, well, I'll start sharing my screen. Can you guys see everything okay? Looks good, thank you, Carlos. Okay, well, I'll begin. The budget for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation Programs is over $300 million. However, the CDCR rehabilitation programs have failed to reduce recidivism rates for nearly two decades. A 2019 report released by the state of California acknowledged the CDCR's attempt at rehabilitation had failed 62% of inmates released in the 2017-2018 fiscal year. My research's objective is to determine whether California should shift its focus from in-prison rehabilitation programs to community re-entry programs. I hypothesize that community re-entry programs will have lower recidivism rates compared to in-prison rehabilitation programs because I believe better control over the offender's environment would be conducive to lower recidivism rates. My research showed that male re-entry programs proved effective in lowering recidivism rates one year post-release. Um, for offenders who participated at, for at least nine months, the program decreased the likelihood of rearrest by 13 percentage points and reconviction by 11 percentage points. Further studies need to be conducted to prove it should be the preferred way of rehabilitation, but what we do know is that more reentry programs developed, a local cultural shift in the normative approach to offenders develop, contributing to lower recidivism rates. Based on this research, my main policy suggestion would be increased funding for community reentry programs, such as the Mayo reentry program with continuous audits mandated by legislation to assure a standard of practice. And that concludes my presentation. Great, thank you so much, Carlos, for a great presentation. Um, and if there is a question from the internship host site office, if you wanna go ahead and raise your hand, then I can go on ahead and unmute you on my end. And you will also just need to go ahead and unmute yourself on your end as well. And Carlos, if you could keep your presentation up, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. If there isn't a question from um, the office, then it will go ahead and go over to our academic team, um, Professor Butters. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, hey, hey, Carlos, a great presentation there. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Uh, one of the things I've wanted to hear about more, it's not, not really a question so much as I, I guess I'm asking you to do it. Can you just tell us more about figure three that you've got there? Like, I know you're, that's kind of the crux of what you're doing, but I, I mean, just tell us more about what, the, what, what we see there in figure three and then tell us more about how you end up with those counties as well. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself, Professor. Um, so you asked about figure figure three, uh, three. Sorry, you're asking what specifically? If I uh... yeah, just tell us more about it. The, the your scatter plot over there. I just want to hear a little more about that nice figure. Okay, yeah. So this this figure was actually uh, uh, the source is a pre prior cohort that dealt with uh, recidivism for here the the UCCS program, and it was just outlining the, the counties in California and their inmate to program ratio. And basically, if you see figure four. Um, 
that's California as a whole, uh, the different the different programs that they're in. What I was really just trying to trying to get at is participation in these programs uh, and how it varied by county. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Professor Butters, for that question, and and thank you again, Carlos, for that great presentation. And so our next student today is going to be Amina Jude, and she interned with the Office of California State Governor Gavin Newsom. Hey everyone. Let me know if you can see the poster, okay? Yeah, looks great, thank you. Throughout the pandemic, California small businesses have been subjected to shutdowns and economic uncertainty. My research question seeks to find out whether or not California's COVID relief program, the California Comeback Plan, contributed to the success of small businesses. My hypothesis is that in fact, California's programs did lead to higher success for small businesses and prevented business closures and permanent job losses. My research design consists of an evaluation of employment numbers before and after relief programs as California's small businesses employ 7.3 billion Californians. I also evaluated surveys of small businesses from the Census Bureau in order to illustrate how responses to questions about the impact of the pandemic changed with the implementation of relief programs. The measures, measures used include employment numbers and the perceived impact of the pandemic on businesses. Using data from the Small Business Administration, the Census Bureau and other community-based organizations, I analyzed the impact of the pandemic before and after the implementation of state relief programs. I found that California businesses had significantly better business outcomes after the implementation of these programs, despite COVID cases remaining high, and that California saw more business openings throughout the pandemic numbers and the highest employment numbers in the country in October of 2021. The implications of my work indicate that California's COVID relief programs helped offset the impacts of the pandemic significantly. And my suggestions are that the state expand these programs to continue through the next two to three years because the economic impacts of the pandemic are longstanding and a full recovery from these impacts is essential. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Amina, for a great presentation. And so if there's a question from the internship website, um, Annie Carney. Hi, thank you so much. And Amina, thank you for the presentation. This is really helpful and interesting. Um, I just have one question for you. Um, we know that immigrant communities have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. So I'm curious if in your research, if you had any findings specific to the experience of immigrant small business owners or any recommendations for how to ensure equitable access um, to programs and information about programs like these in the future. Yeah, so I found that um, immigrant businesses were far more likely to participate in the state's programs rather than the federal programs, um, because a lot of those programs were more targeted to immigrant businesses. The one way that we could help immigrant owned businesses is by expanding um, applications, expanding all of these eligibility requirements to make them more accessible and easier to access for immigrant business owners who don't necessarily have the same access to language resources and um, you know, lawyers and other financial resources that make the applications easier for other people. Great, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Annie Harney, for that question. And thank you, um, thank you, Amina, for that great presentation again. And so our next student is Avi Reddy, um, who interned with the Office of California State Governor, Gavin Newsom, this term. Hello, everyone, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you just fine, thank you. And can you see my screen all right? Yep, looks great. Awesome. All right, so hello everyone. I'll be doing a presentation today. Throwing money at the problem. Has the local control funding formula made progress in improving educational outcomes for high-need students? Since the implementation of the local control funding formula, also known as the LCFF, millions of dollars have been invested into school districts based on the amount of high-need students enrolled. Despite this, high need students continue to struggle academically, and there's been little improvement in their standardized test scores. This raises the question, if the LCFF really did help high need students improve their educational standards as it intended to do. To answer this, I propose that the local control funding formula, the LCFF, has not substantially increased standardized test passage rates for high need students. To test this hypothesis, I looked at two similar school districts, Lucia Mar Unified and Upland Unified, and compared their standardized test scores for high need students in these districts. I classified high need students as low income and English learning students. I looked at these scores before and after the implementation of the LCFF to see if scores had improved. I actually found that scores remained consistent and remained low. 
However, English learners in particular saw their scores decline both before and after the LCFF. This leads me to believe that the LCFF had little impact in improving standardized test scores for high need students. However, this does not mean that the LCFF is a bad policy, but is not improving educational outcomes as it's sought to do. One solution to remedy this could have the state government provide more oversight on these uh, funds and implement stricter regulations as to what LCFF dollars can be used for and more specific programs for high need students. Ultimately, the LCFF had the right idea, but when put into practice, it failed to deliver. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Avi, for that great presentation. And then we have a question from Emily Patterson. Hi, thank you so much for that presentation. Good to see you again, Abby. Um, question for you on LCFF funding. Were you able to see if these schools spent their increased dollars specifically for programs for these high need students? Was that something you were able to find in your research? Um, thank you for your question, Emily, and it's good to see you again too. And actually, yes, um, but the problem was is that it wasn't consistent. There were some districts that did report them and some that didn't. For example, Lucia Mar did not report what they used their funds for, but Upland did. And even still, when I looked at those fundings, Upland only gave tens, uh, only a couple thousand dollars to specific programs dedicated to high need students. And the rest of the money either went to basic necessities such as teacher salaries or classroom supplies. And that was something that was very interesting that I wanted to include more on on my poster, but just couldn't find the room to. But yeah, so I was able to find a lot of the information for some of the districts, but not all of them. Awesome, thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Emily, for that question. And then thank you, Avi, for a great presentation today. And so our next student is Joshua Tinka. And he interned with the Office of California State Governor, Gavin Newsom. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, y'all coming through great. Uh, oh, Zoom quit. Hmm. I'm having a little technical issues right that's now. My, totally my Zoom just fine. shut down. Yeah, that's totally fine, Josh. We will, we will actually come back to you, all right? Awesome, so sorry about that. No problem, those things happen. All right, so um, our next student then is gonna be Lainey Martinez, um, and she interned with the Office of Sacramento City Council member, Rick Jennings' office. Hello, everyone, can you hear me all right? Yes, sounds great, Lainey. Perfect. Um, Perfect. California. Oh, can you see this? Sorry. Yep, it looks. Yep, we can see it perfectly. Thank you, Lainey. Uh, California is considered a state with the nation's highest poverty rate that consistently ranks near the bottom when it comes to enrolling low income households in CalFresh. CalFresh being the nutritional food stamp program that provides monthly electronic benefits to assist individuals and families with low income to purchase most foods. In this research, I will be focusing on how CalFresh benefits affect the poverty rate level before and post pandemic and how eligibility has also played a factor within these state changes. During the pandemic, legislators recognized CalFresh as an important avenue for supporting families and took action in to increase benefit amounts for recipients. Today, 5.6 million people access and depend on these benefits, even though there still is a lack of providing this resource from the state and counties. See, seeing that state laws have changed to provide more benefits and accessibility, there is an expected decrease in poverty rates since the eligibility requirements have off opened an extra opportunity for more people to apply. My hypothesis is as eligibility requirements become more open and accessible, the rates of individuals receiving CalFresh um, will in increase leading um, to helping the poverty rate in food insecurity and overall in the state decrease. I focused on counties such as Imperial Valley, where it has a significant higher rate than the average percentage of residents that live below the poverty line when compared to the rest of California. Sacramento and Yolo counties will be my other focuses because of the high levels of low-income households, in addition to there being a significant population of ethnic-based households, which shows that these communities util utilize this program the most. My findings show that the effects of the 15% benefits for COVID-19 relief have caused an de a decrease in poverty value only within those receiving CalFresh. However, it, re it remains increasing as a state because of the lack of outreach to to apply and the and the resources provided by the counties 
in all three counties, less than 12% of the eligible populations are receiving these benefits, which creates high concerns for high levels of food insecurity and housing crisis. Although California has given this additional resource for the people, there should be an implementation of policies that automatically enroll eligible individuals in CalFresh and provide extra funding for utility financial assistance as they already do so. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Lainey, for a great presentation today. And it looks like we have a question from Henry Atkinson. Hi, Lainey. Uh, so I have a, a just a quick question about uh, the reasoning that you had in selecting the individual counties that you were looking at. Um, so I know it, you, what you have here is two with high poverty rates and one in between. It, by in between, do you mean a more average rate? Mm -hmm, that's correct. Okay. So the, it totally makes sense why you would pick those two categories. What, I, what I'm curious in is, do you think there would have been value in also selecting a county that has a low poverty rate to see if there is a difference in the, in, the impact of CalFresh in an area that already has a low poverty rate? Um, so I did want to focus on that. However, um, I wanted to focus more on um, counties that have a lot of, um, in, uh, the, have their population, um, how do I explain it? That they have a huge population of eligible um, applicants, but comparing that to also um, those who have applied, um, wait, sorry. I wanted to, comp the reason why I chose these um, these counties was because they had a good amount of, re of data to compare the population of those that qualify for, for CalFresh in comparison to those that have CalFresh. Um, that's why I didn't want to really focus on the ones that had a lower poverty rates since I wouldn't be receiving much information regarding them. Um, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely, great job. It's also nice to see you. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much, Henry, for that question. And, and thank you for a great presentation, Lainey. And so um, Josh, are you ready to kind of come back to you or? Yeah, I think I got it working. Let's awesome. fingers crossed. <laughs> All right, so, so John, Josh Tinkoff with the Office of California State Governor, Gavin Newsom's office. All right. Uh, can everyone see? Is the poster okay? Everyone can see it. Yep, we can see the poster. Awesome. All right. So my research objective was to look at how the legalization of recreational marijuana in California has impacted the illegal market. The reason is is that part of the big push for the legalization campaign was to remove the illegal element from the cannabis industry as a total from California. So my research was to examine whether or not that worked. I identified tax rates as a good point of contact to see if that is affecting illegal marijuana production in California or not, and compared two different states, Oregon and California, based off of their illegal production growth in each state as a proportion of their total marijuana sales in the state. I picked these two states because Oregon and California have about a 15% uh, difference in their tax rates. Oregon is sitting about 20% on their tax rate, and California uh, varies between about 32 to about 37 or 28 to about 37 percent on their tax rate. Uh, and as we collected data, I saw that there was a conclusion about 80 percent of total marijuana sales in California are coming from illegal marijuana cultivation or illegal marijuana retail uh, uh, producers, whereas only around 55 percent are coming from Oregon illegal markets. Therefore, we can see that there is uh, there is correlation between the tax rate and the illegal markets as this difference is almost exact to the difference of the tax rates between these two states. Um, there were some limitations on this data as this is uh, talking about illegal markets and we don't have a lot of research on, uh, which is why my policy proposal going forward would be to reduce the lower, reduce the municipality tax rate in California, which is increasing by about five to 15% California tax rates on marijuana products as well as developing more research into these fields to have better enforcement and a better understanding of the problems of the illegal marijuana markets within California and Oregon. Fantastic, thank you so much, Josh. And so we've got a question from Emily Patterson. Hi, Josh, good to see you again. Um, question for you, I see you have a bit of a point on your policy proposal about federal legalization. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more. I was wondering if you had a hypothesis on federal legalization, how that would affect this phenomenon. Yes, so um, it's great to see you again as well. Uh, but federal legalization would allow for federal enforcement of legal marijuana farms. As it stands right now in California, 
all marijuana dispensaries and cultivation is federally illegal. So if we were to allow for federal enforcement, every single certified and legal producer of cannabis would be arrested. Therefore, if we allow it to be legalized federally uh, and allow federal enforcement to actually come in and regulate this, we would actually be able to identify these farms that are going under the state systems and under the federal system and begin weeding out these actual illegal cultivations or illegal producers of marijuana or retail sellers of marijuana differently than just what the states can do. Awesome. Do you have a, a thoughts on like a federal baseline tax on marijuana, how that would affect this? Uh, I think if there was a federal baseline tax, it would affect it. If the states are still allowed to have their own excise tax and other things on that. So I think that if there was to be federally legalized and we see a standard federal tax rate across the board, we would still see a decrease in uh, marijuana and illegal marijuana cultivation as a whole because the federal tax rate tends to be lower than California tax rates in general. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Emily Patterson, for that question. And, and thank you, Josh, for a great presentation today. And so our next student is Luz Alba, and she interned this term with the Mexican Consulate. Can you guys see it? Yes, looks great. Thank you, Luz. Hello, my name is Luz Alba, and my research project is centered around the relationship between educational attainment and utilization of mental health care service among Latinos. Did you know that although Latinos are one of the largest racial ethnic groups accounting for 39.4% of California's population, they have the lowest rates of higher education attainment. For this reason, I decided to analyze the effect that educational attainment has on the Latino population in respect to their utilization of mental health care services and to the extent in which it impacts. My research question is, what effect does educational attainment have on the utilization of mental health care services among the Latino population in California? I hypothesize that higher educational attainment is associated with higher mental care service utilization. It's important for all people, regardless of their ethnicity, to have equal accessibility to mental health care services. Therefore, observing a possible level of association among both the independent variable being educational attainment and the dependent variable being utilization of mental health care services can be a possible explanation of mental health care service disparities among California's largest population. Through California Health Interview Survey, I was able to conclude that more educational attainment a Latino has correlates with more utilization of mental health care services in comparison to Latinos with lower educational attainment, as shown in figure two. Thus, my findings supported my hypothesis. Additionally, a confounding variable in this study could be to control for income. By analyzing different federal poverty levels, there could be an intersection between educational attainment leading to the utilization of mental health care services. Therefore, given what I have discovered in my research project, some future policy suggestions would consist of allocating funding to implement more resources to encourage Latinos to obtain higher education. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Liz, for that great presentation. Um, and if there's a uh, question from, from the Internship Host Site office, if you wanna just go ahead and raise your hand, I can go ahead and call and unmute you. And if not, then we'll go ahead and go over to the academic team. All right, Sharif. All right, thank you, an excellent presentation. That was uh, really well done. Uh, my question is, how do you think your results would translate to uh, different racial groups? Thank you for your question. And um, my, do you mind repeating it one more time? Sure. Uh, how do you, do you think you would find the same results among whites, African-Americans, and Asians? I, based off what I discovered through my research project, I do believe that we would find the same result with minority groups, specifically Latinos and um, black, more of the underrepresentatives, just because Asians do, like the Asian population do tend to have a higher level of um, educational attainment. Same goes for the white population. Therefore, it goes more for underrepresented minority groups that tend to have a lower educational attainment. 
Great, thank you. I hope that answers your question. It did, yes. Great work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheree, for your question. And Luz, thank you so much for a great presentation today. And so our next student is Daniela Dula Mejia. Um, and she interned this term with the Office of the United States Congresswoman, Doris Matsui. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you see my screen? Yes, looks great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so my research was on magic mushrooms and mental health, and I wanted to see if the legalization of psychedelics and if there was a link to mental health in general. So some background, in 2019, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health reported that 29% of California young adults suffer from some sort of mental health illness. There's been an increase in reported substance abuse as well as suicide rates nationally. And in 2020, Oregon became the first state to legalize all drugs, including psychedelics. And California is attempting to do the same thing with SB 517, which was introduced this past year. So my research question asked two things. Are people with worsening mental health compared to two years ago, so the beginning of COVID, more supportive or less supportive of legalization of psychedelics? And secondly, does this support also translate to future usage as a treatment of their illnesses as well? So I hypothesized that uh, there should be strong support for legalization as well as higher level of comfort in using this as a treatment if given the opportunity for persons with worse mental health compared to two years ago. My research design utilized a survey distributed to 168 California residents, which measured both respondents' mental health as well as their attitudes towards my, my two independent variables. As of the 168, 61 reported having worsening mental health, and 38% uh, reported that they were somewhat supportive of legalization compared to only 11% who strongly opposed, which was a significant difference that supported my first part of the hypothesis. Surprisingly, only 21% felt that they were somewhat comfortable with using psychedelics in a controlled setting to treat their mental illnesses, and a majority of 31% felt neutral about the usage. Although it does show that there's an increase in attitudes in using psychedelics to treat mental health illnesses, it does not mean that they themselves are willing to use it just yet, even though it might be available. So my suggestion is to work with educating populations about drug use before policy is implemented, so that way people are aware of dosage, when to seek help, and what the signs of a psychological break could look like. I also suggest creating an educational public health program, such as the ones at college campuses that inform young adults about alcohol usage, alcohol poisoning, and when to seek help with the assistance of those matters. Thank you very much. Great, Daniela. Thank you so much for your presentation today. And so if there's a question for, for the internship host site, if you want to just go ahead and raise your hand, like go ahead and unmute you on our end. All right, and then if not, over to the academic team. All right, Professor Kula. Hi, oh, yes, <laughs> really nice presentation. Um, I just uh, was wondering if you had um, done any kind of more investigating into fact other factors that may affect support or opposition to legalization um, with some of the other maybe demographics questions you looked at. You mentioned Republicans and Democrats share, you know, support equally. I was just wondering if you found anything that seemed to affect support. So one of the things that I thought um, or that I found, I haven't looked too much in depth, but I did notice that um, that race or identified did have some type of effect on terms of like what persons felt um, about support of this type of thing. And so white populations actually were more in favor. And then those that identified as Latino or African-American were less in support. So that was one thing, but um, I have to go more in depth into that. Great, thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Professor Quilla for that question. And Daniela, thank you so much for a great presentation today. And so um, our next student is Beatrice No, and she interned this term with the California Asian Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus. Hello. Um, can you see the screen? Yes, looks great. Okay, thank you. So according to the CDC, suicide is one of 10 leading causes of death in the US. Many of these were caused by increased anxiety and depression due to societal and economic factors. I hypothesized that since ethnic minorities are more likely to be affected by mental health disparities and societal stressors, their anxiety and depressive levels will increase due to the political events that focus on racial discrimination from 2016 to 2021. In the data from the National Health and Interview Survey, I found that throughout the years, Blacks and Hispanics have high worry and depressive levels, and that events such as the death of George Floyd and the election of Donald Trump did not significantly affect them. This may be due to the normalization of their problems. However, for AAPI, depressive levels shown in figure three increased during the 2019 COVID outbreak due to the surge of Asian hate crimes and increased media coverage of it. 
Lastly, a short survey I conducted in 2021 in California revealed that worry and depressive frequency are felt almost weekly, and most stated that their anxiety are mainly caused by the pandemic, their job, and worrying about the safety and welfare of their family. Although I did not find significant effects, it is very important for us to look more thoroughly towards the mental health of different racial minorities, as everyone have different intersectional problems. My policy recommendation focuses on increasing data collection towards mental health and hate crimes to improve research, while also increasing resources and accessibility to mental health care services. Great, thank you so much for that great presentation, Beatrice. And so um, if there is a um, question for the internship host slide, if you wanna go ahead and raise your hand, I can go ahead and unmute you on my end and just need to unmute yourself on yours. All right, and then if not, over to the academic team. All right, Professor Betters. Thanks, Cindy, uh, and thanks, Beatrice, for a great presentation and for a great quarter, obviously. Uh, I have a question for you about uh, figure four there, which is your Qualtrics survey that was run through us, right? So uh, uh, among those groups you got listed there, I'm just curious about uh, why you think that, that there's lower levels of depression symptoms among Blacks and Asians in your surveys, in your survey that you ran relative to the other, uh, to, the, to the other category, which is worry frequency. Um, and I was wondering if you, is it just an artifact of just having so few people that maybe are, are Black or Asian that responded? Or what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think it is a little bit on like, they have lower, at least for the Blacks, um, they have lower amounts. Like I didn't get as much as I wanted, but um, for Asian, it usually is like lower in some cases. And like, we could see even like in 2020, their depressive level, like in figure three, you could see like it went down so fast, aside from 2019, if you could see figure three. And I think for Asian, it just, it, it just gets leveled up later on. But um, that's why 2019 felt very significant because it went like higher than expected. Um, and that's why, that's what I thought about um, for figure four. All right, thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Professor Butters for the question. And Beatrice, thank you again for that great presentation. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and give Sue just a, a sec here to go ahead and end our recording.